morning and welcome to the Stalls TV Morning Show. I'm Zach. And I'm Josh. And today we're excited to be back with you. Last week you were with Bob and Courtney learning all about trade show, how to prepare for a trade show attendance, which shows to go to, mm -hmm. um, and really what you can learn at a show. And today the theme is embroidery and specifically applique, as you may have learned through the poll question. So it's nice to have a, a good number of embroiderers on. And for those 30 odd percent of you that don't have embroidery uh, heads or capacity to date, uh, we hope to share some technology with you today that may help you kind of grow your business and take it to the next step all through applique and embroidery. Absolutely. So let's sit down, let's go through um, today's session all about embroiderers. And uh, to kick things off, just as a follow-up question, as we're grabbing our seat, we're gonna launch a poll um, we know a lot of you have embroidery capability already, different number of heads, but we want to know who is actually doing applique because we're going to talk a lot about applique. Um, so for those of you that have embroidery, if you can answer this. This will give us a good baseline for our discussion point today here on the Stalls TV Morning Show. Most of the votes have come in, and it looks like a pretty good 50-50 split on who is currently doing applique and who is not. Hopefully that split is between the embroiderers, obviously, and not the folks who don't have embroidery equipment. But Yeah, so absolutely. Kind of to kick things off, we like to um, take this from sort of a, uh, an overarching business strategy concept and really look at the challenges of a particular shop mm -hmm. and understand how um, technology and decorating methods um, s help to solve those challenges um, to really present opportunities. So when we look at embroiderers in general, mm -hmm. uh, what do we know about embroiderers shops in general? Uh, embroiderer shops in general have machines that operate with needles and thread, oh, wow. to put simply. <laughs> okay. No, what we know about the embroidery process is that one of the biggest challenges is capacity. So for those of you out there who have the one to five embroidery heads, obviously you have significantly less capacity than those who voted that they have 12 plus heads, whether that's one large machine or a bunch of individual ones doesn't necessarily matter how it works, but there is a limited amount of capacity, a limited amount of times that that needle can pierce through an applique fabric or any type of fabric and put a stitch through it. Most folks are operating, uh, just in my experience, at 750 stitches per minute, sometimes upwards of 1,000, maybe 1,250, depending on the machines that you have or what you're actually sewing, but 1,000 stitches per minute is all you can output per embroidery head. Yeah, so the, the challenge is um, output and throughput through the actual machine mm -hmm. and turning that sometimes potentially large investment into sellable products yeah. that create profit opportunities and margins. So one of the key things that um, applique solves is increasing throughput. So we're going to share a, a quick image to display this concept on the screen here with you. It's just um, um, a Hard Rock, Rock Cafe logo, and this is done by an embroidery shop online and how they demonstrate the difference between direct embroidery and applique. So the image that you see uh, that's direct embroidery where the, the text is in white primarily for hard on Hard Rock, you're seeing 51,698 stitches, uh, which makes up 74 minutes of machine time. So basically over the course of an eight-hour day, I don't know, you might be able to sew seven of these out yep. uh, per head of embroidery. And we look um, to the other image with the sort of uh, leopard print, and we see this is three pieces of applique fabric, which is um, applique in general can be a variety of types of fabrics. We'll talk about that, but a fabric instead of a fill stitch. So it's replacing the heavy direct embroidery areas, especially in the um, sort of heart of the circle there. And we reduce the stitch count to 21,606 in 30 minutes of production time on the machine. So you can see a side-by-side -side comparison there. Really, um, to put the math simple, we're producing two where we were only producing one prior. So literally uh, doubling our throughput on this example. Yeah, all just by replacing the fill stitch with a piece of fabric and only doing an outline stitch, which we'll talk about the different types of outline stitches here in a minute. But Sure, yeah, so um, you know, to, to understand the fundamentals of applique and how that works, I'd like to just walk you through the basic process um, more or less, you need a cut piece of fabric, mm -hmm. regardless of what that is. It can be a variety of different fabrics. You're going to sew uh, what's called a placement stitch onto the garment. And this basically is just an area where a targeted area, after the garment's hooped, you yep. program a stop, and then you're going to lay the fabric onto that placement stitch. So 
if we look at an example like I have here to my left, uh, we'll show you a placement stitch. So we have a placement stitch sewn onto this fabric. And then more or less, if I wanted to do um, sew out applique, I would take the individual pieces um, to spell Columbia here and individually place them on top of this. Now, that can be done with a pressure sensitive like twill, so it has a sticky backing so it holds in place, or you can hit it with a light spray tack, but the concept is you sew this placement stitch, you place your individual cut pieces, and then ultimately you um, sew out your stitch type, regardless of what that is. And so, challenges of applique are sometimes individual placement, mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, with an operator working that machine, you're still going to save on your total output time because to place that would be much simpler than to wait the machine time if you have the labor. Yeah, absolutely. It actually makes, um, for those of you who do your own digitizing, which I know a lot of embroiderers don't do their own digitizing, applique digitizing is significantly easier than fill stitch digitizing and pull comps and uh, taking into consideration the fabric uh, that you're going on. So digitizing gets a little bit easier for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you look at, when you look at this process, you need to get a cut piece. Sometimes that's the challenge for people yeah. is um, they're intimidated by cutting this fabric or they can't figure out how to cut it with their vinyl cutter. So when you look at um, cutting technology in general, it's an important, important part of the equation. Mm -hmm. You have knife cutting, yes. um, typically in a roll style cutter or a flatbed. Um, you have laser cutting, and then you can get into water jet and some other technologies, but by far and large, you're looking at knife cutting and laser cutting. Absolutely. Um, and so what are the considerations uh, for applique fabrics that work across those um, technology sets? Uh, as far as knife cutting goes, it really depends on the model of knife cutter that you have. If you're using a standard roll-fed 24-inch cutter, you're going to be looking at uh, pressure-sensitive twills. Uh, I know a lot of folks who are using craft cutters like the Silhouette that's out there. Um, as long as the material can be backed with a pressure sensitive carrier, so whether that's a mask or some type of sticky mask, you can almost put any type of fabric that's not going to be thicker than a, than a poly twill mm -hmm. um, through one of those machines. When you go to the laser, you start to consider what colors are you actually cutting because on whites and lighter colors, you have to have your laser dialed in and the air vents right to where you don't get a browning around the edge okay. on your lighter colors, those types of things. But the laser is going to be able to cut a wider variety of materials probably faster than your knife cutter is going to. However, the knife cutter is significantly less expensive and can get you good results. You just won't want to finish with a um, what we'll review as a bean stitch. You always want to finish with a zigzag or a satin stitch on those knife cut items. Okay, good. So you, you mentioned a couple different products there. So ultimately, um, you need to have a cutter that mm -hmm. can cut the pressure sensitive poly twill at the very basic uh, for a roll style cutter that's back. So it's two ply. You're cutting only through one layer. Yep. Um, if you go to a laser cutter, you can lay um, basically any fabric into the bed of it as long as you watch out for the scorching and adjust your machine accordingly. Yes. And then there's sort of an in-betweener and that's the flatbed knife cutters mm -hmm. that sometimes you can get a wider variety of materials but definitely has to be sewn mm -hmm. um, if it's knife cut. That way you're not getting the fraying. Correct. Um, as well. So let's go over some s different stitch types and uh, talk a little bit about that so we have some basic knowledge there. So we'll start with the uh, most fundamental and popular stitch type and you'll be seeing this on field with uh, the football jerseys when uh, kickoff happens here in just a few short weeks uh, is a zigzag stitch. Um, Zach, what do we know about a zigzag stitch? Uh, well, like you said, it is the most popular. It's typically used on uh, knife or laser cut twills. Um, and the stitch ratio is about 17, anywhere between 15 and 18 stitches per inch is what you're going to see on a typical zigzag stitch, which you'll see a, a huge uh, difference between that and a satin stitch and also from the fill stitching that, that we looked at. Good. So um, this particular example that I'm showing you here, the dark charcoal, um, would actually be a satin stitch. It almost looks like another color of fabric there. And then the orange stitching on the orange uh, poly twill mm -hmm. would be a zigzag stitch. So what do we know about a satin stitch? Uh, the satin stitch is typically used to give the, the effect that you're seeing there to get a second color without a second layer of fabric um, to where uh, it, it can be decreased machine time depending on, on how it's digitized. But a satin stitch, you're looking at anywhere from 55 to 75 stitches per inch compared to that 17 or 18 on the zigzag stitch. So four to five times as many stitches in a satin stitch design than a zigzag stitch. 
Okay, so basically we're, with the satin stitch, we're getting a completely different look, as you can see in the two stitch types here. But we're also getting uh, a little bit more machine time, but sometimes that can be sort of uh, balanced with the fact that we're picking up what looks like an extra color of, of twill or fabric that doesn't require that cutting and placement. Correct. Okay, and then the last stitch type that we're going to point out here today is what's called a bean stitch. So you can see it here in the context of a distressed applique on chino twill, mm -hmm. which is just a little bit different fabric base. But uh, tell us what you know about a bean stitch. A uh, bean stitch is typically used in these fashion applications where fraying can be desired or on materials that don't have a tendency to fray, like a wool or an acrylic felt. Yeah, something like this where you get an actual felt finish. You can see the sort of fuzzy texture to it, and you're still getting the uh, bean stitch. So ultimately, um, as far as stitches per inch, this takes significantly less machine time than any of the other stitches. Yeah, it's essentially the same as your lay down stitch. Okay, which is very quick, very easy. So definitely would um, give you a lot of throughput. Mm -hmm. um, so just before I leave this station, I want to show you some uh, different applique fabric types as well. If we can just back out the camera angle slightly. Uh, here we go. So we have poly twill. Um, poly twill, once again, is the most basic. Um, this is a, a rigid type of material. Uh, the advantage of poly twill is that in addition to being sort of the core product that powers most applications, uh, the name poly implies that it's polyester base. And so you can start to pick up patterns in it when you start to apply technology such as sublimation on top of the twill. So in this instance, you're getting that sort of zebra stripe that's been sublimated onto white poly twill finished with a neon green satin stitch with a little bit of direct embroidery where it says gift and more. So poly twill you can order in a variety of different ways. Um, you can order it pressure sensitive, which means it has a sticky backing for easy placement. You can order it with a permanent adhesive if you just want to cut, uh, cut it with a laser and apply it without any stitch time. Or you can order it uh, basically uncoated without adhesive. Um, so you can apply your own adhesive down uh, for application or just sew it. But mm -hmm. adhesive is always recommended in finishing with a heat press so you don't get that puckering um, after it's laundered. So that's poly twill, polyester based twill in a few different varieties. And then once again, this is our chino twill. So we get our natural cotton type twill, uh, much more prevalent in the fashion forward designs, uh, sort of an Abercrombie look for lack of a better word. Um, it's softer on the person that's wearing it. You can get uh, cool distressed effects and, and really step it up um, a, a notch. And then um, there's a, you can go basically any fabric type can be used for applique, but this one is our wool felt. Um, also can be used is acrylic felt. So this gives you your fuzzy um, sort of texture uh, to the finished fabric. And all of these are sewn applications, but rest assured with some suppliers, not only can you order the cut piece for sewing, you can order um, basically stuff with simulated stitches. So you can kind of see on the edge of this, it looks like it's sewn. It has that sort of edge to it, but it's just heat applied. So for those of you without embroidery, um, yes, you can partner with a local embroiderer to complete your sewn applications, or you can order something like Sim Stitch that looks sewn, uh, but is just heat applied. And the Sim Stitch is, you know, a product that can be ordered in patterns as well. So you get a lot of different finishes. Um, that's a little bit about stitch types and applique fabrics. Now I'm going to jump over here um, to a new pro relatively new process for applique um, called rip-away applique. And the real beauty of this process for an embroiderer, Zach, is that there is no cutting involved. Right. So vinyl cutter, that flatbed cutter, knife, or laser isn't, isn't necessary for this process. So it, it drives some simplicity. Once again, we have our placement stitch. Rather than having to lay down individual pieces, you get the advantage of laying down a panel of a film-based product. This is a polyurethane film, a particular version of thermofilm. It has like a leather-like appearance. So you notice we're sewing that satin stitch that we learned about. Um, the satin stitch is actually cutting the material for you. It's perforating it. Mm -hmm. So a couple key things here. One, you're going to take a little bit more machine time with rip-away applique because we are sewing the satin stitch. Not only is it a satin stitch, it's a denser satin stitch to make sure it's perforating the material accurately for ripping away. And so a zigzag or a bean stitch here. Once you uh, sew it, you rip away and you finish it with a heat press. And you can see some of the, the finishes here. We have you know uh, leather-like with thermofilm. There's glitter, flock. Um, if we keep going on down, there's a reflective, which gives you a sort of some high visibility into a sewn application. And then, once again, we're seeing the use of patterns, in this case, with a solvent printable material. So a real quick demo before we 
conclude this section on Ripaway applique, I have a sample here. Um, this has just been sewn out. We did this at our Stalls TV grand opening where we did two colors of twill, a red and a white with a zigzag stitch, and then we finished it and combined the processes with a glitter flake ripaway applique. So the concept is, you know, you just sew that satin stitch, make sure it's dense enough, and then you are just going to rip away this excess material. Um, make sure you peel out any center uh, components to kind of clean it up. Want to keep some uh, tweezers or snips or a, a weeding tool nearby. But basically within minutes, we're cleaning this up, kind of the equivalent of weeding for heat transfer film, right? but it's much better than individually placing all these components. And once I've concluded here, I finish that with a heat press and I have a completed design. Um, so pretty powerful uh, technology. Yeah, one of the other things, Josh, that, um, that we, we kind of didn't mention, uh, what the satin stitch does, not only does it give you a two or a three color option without putting the fabric down, it also makes it a bit lighter weight. So people can substitute a satin stitch on garments that require a lighter weight application that might not normally respond well to, to applique or, or some type of heavy thing on it, but the satin stitch will lighten that up. Right, so hopefully this is a little bit of baseline. The idea here is we started with the challenge of embroiderers and that's basically your limit on, you're limited on your throughput unless you want to invest tens of thousands of dollars in additional throughput or another machine. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this gives you some ideas on how you can kind of take your embroidery business to the next level or even considerations as you're looking to invest in embroidery, uh, whether or not it's the right direction for you. Here are yep. some different looks and finishes that you can execute in your shop. Now, if an embroidery business wants to grow, um, applique and sewn applications aren't the only way. When that machine is sewing for 30 minutes or 74 minutes at a time, regardless of what it is, uh, there's a little bit of power in something called a heat press. And we're going to turn this over to Dan Kane from Transfer Express to talk a little bit about the power of a heat press for embroiderers specifically. I'm Dan Kane with Stalls Transfer Express and today we're going to talk about how to grow your embroidery business with screen printed transfers. How many of you embroiderers right now are outsourcing your screen printing? Have you ever thought about bringing it in? What if I told you that there was a way you could bring in your own screen printing uh, without having to purchase the expensive equipment and having all the mess and the learning curve uh, that some screen printers have with just a screen printed transfer like this? Well the answer is you can. And all you need to start is a heat press. Uh, this heat press we have here is the Hotronics Auto Open Clam. It will cost you about only $1,500 as opposed to thousands and thousands of dollars of screen printed equipment. The screen printed transfer gives you a secondary option to your embroidery business if you're not using it uh, screen printing at all. Um, so it's something that you can have. As you see, this heat press does not take up that much space. So if you're working out of your home or even out of a small office space, you could fit this into a room, the same room as your embroidery machine possibly, or into another room. And you could have one job running on your embroidery machine and you could be doing another screen printed job with your transfers and your heat press. On average, on the safe side, we say you can usually produce one shirt per minute using the custom screen printed transfers. So think about that. That's 60 shirts in one hour that you've produced while your embroidery machine is running either hats for the same job or it could be a complete different job and you're killing two birds with one stone. Uh, many times we, we hear embroiderers have to turn away a screen printed business and send it to a competitor up the road. Well now, using screen printed transfers, you become a one-stop shop for your customer and never have to turn a, you know, a screen printed job away again. And as I promised earlier, let me show you how easy it is to press this transfer. Now we're using a smaller platen to accommodate for the pocket and the seam we have here. But the first thing I'm going to do is load my shirt, make sure that seam's not there and pre-press the garment for a recommended four seconds. Then I'm going to take my screen printed transfer face down. And this transfer is a 10 second press with a hot peel. So we'll let that go. Pretty easy, no mess, no screen printing equipment, just a heat press. And my embroidery machine is still going. So here we have a two color screen printed shirt that we just did in less than a minute by using screen printed transfers. So think about how much profit you're leaving out there by not having this option in your business. 
We've heard from other embroiderers who have started using screen printed transfers that they've grown their business over 40% in the first year of using these. I'm Dan Kane. Thank you for joining us today. I want to thank Dan for taking the time to come into Stalls TV Studios and teach you guys a little bit uh, about how to finance the growth of your business with the addition of a heat press. Sometimes financing our growth uh, hap needs to happen more than just organically. Sometimes we need to grow our business more quickly than um, organic growth gives us the opportunity to do. So what I want to do today is just take a few minutes to tell you about four different ways to finance growth outside of just growing it organically through the sales and marketing efforts that you have. Sometimes we need to add employees, sometimes we need to add equipment, sometimes we get orders that are so large that, that we can't um, finance the inventory for that. So there's other ways to finance that growth. The first one is probably the one that's most popular right now that you see on television in the show uh, Shark Tank, and that is through um, the private sector, private equity, venture capital, or angel investors. So most venture capital funds and private uh, equity funds go into tech companies or, or companies that are in very um, high growth industries or high growth markets because the investor sees a way to quickly make their money back and exit the, uh, the business. So typically what happens is someone would give your company money for a portion of ownership. For most of us decorators, we might find that in an angel investor. An angel investor can be someone who is a friend or a family member that is willing to put an influx of cash into our business for a percentage of the business ownership. The risk with going that route is that percentage of ownership also gives them a percentage of the decision-making uh, responsibilities uh, unless you negotiate that up front. So something to consider there. You can find friends or family as angel investors to give you money to finance your growth uh, by giving them a percentage of ownership in the company. The second way to finance growth is through the United States government. There's actually a uh, United States Small Business Administration that exists specifically just to grow, help small businesses grow. In the past year, they've actually financed or helped out uh, over a thousand small businesses in the U.S. with over $5.5 billion in capital. Now, what you probably don't realize is they actually provide that funding through private equity funds and they just guarantee the money. So you can visit the um, Small Business Association website, I believe it's sba.gov, uh, and find out more about some of those programs. A third way to fund your growth is through revenue-based capital. Now this one, uh, revenue-based capital has existed in the oil and gas industries and the pharmaceutical industry for a long time. You probably know it as royalty-based capital. So what happens is someone is willing to invest money into your business and you pay them back just based on a percentage of your sales until they get their money back plus whatever the negotiated deal is. So this one is great for industries with a really high margin where you don't need all of the profit to go back into the business to continue day-to-day -day operations. Doesn't tend to work well uh, necessarily in our industry. However, uh, it does help during uh, slow seasons because you're not paying your investors back if you don't have business coming in. So that's revenue base capital. Now the fourth and final one, which is probably the most popular or the most cool uh, right now that people are, are checking out is crowdfunding. And what crowdfunding is, is when you are offering a reward, not, not a percentage of your company or not a cash-based reward, but some type of reward for cash invested in your business. In your business. This one works really well if you have a well-defined outcome that you need. So if you want to invest in a particular piece of equipment and you can define that and define what the return on it is going to be and provide some great rewards to the people who are willing to invest, this is a way to get small amounts of capital, anywhere from five, ten, twenty thousand. Some of the larger campaigns have raised upwards of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but most of them are seeking somewhere between one and ten thousand uh, dollars as a crowdfunding campaign. So you can check that out online as well. So those are four ways outside of organic growth that you can grow or finance the growth of your business. Good, Zach. Thanks for that. So business growth is something to be very excited about. The one yep. that intrigues me most is, you know, the one you reference as the coolest is uh, mm -hmm. crowdfunding. Where would a decorator go um, to find out about that? What sort of websites can they uh, do that on? Two of the most popular ones are Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Those were kind of two of the originators of the crowdfunding campaigns and they make it really easy to run campaigns and do a great job of explaining exactly what it is and how to be successful at it.
Interesting. So if uh, you've benefited from any of those ways in your business, um, we'd welcome you just share those with us um, throughout the Stalls TV Morning Show. We'd love to share those with other decorators on our blog. Mm -hmm. And we'd encourage you to grow your business uh, by tuning in for all the buzz news and know-how every week on the Stalls TV Morning Show. Thanks for watching this morning.